Travis in the studio with us. Travis, how did you do with your bio? He did pretty damn good. But can I say that? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> I should have asked before. We can say whatever we okay, want perfect. because we can edit. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Travis, I think the listening audience is so curious as to people with gifts, and some of them who are listening are listening because they have gifts and they don't understand them. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that you went through uh, in childhood was being on Psychic Kids. Right. When did you first realize you were different? Um, and how did being on, how did actually ending up on that show actually happen? So I guess uh, probably around middle school is when I realized something was different. Mm-hmm. Looking back, I can't say that there was a definitive experience that started everything. I've just always known what I've known, felt what I felt, saw what I saw. It wasn't, and I've always been a shy kid, so it wasn't until middle school where you start to kind of figure out who you are as a person and, and, you know, form your social connections where I speak things and people look at me like, wow, you know, how'd you know that? Or what are you talking about? Like, wait a minute, you don't see colors around people. You don't get movies in your head or you don't know things. And then I was like, well, wait a minute, maybe I'm a freak. Um, so I'm not going to talk about this anymore. And that kind of sent me on that, this journey of exploring, um, you know, my first job, I've, I've always had a love of reading. My first job was at a library and for, I worked there for maybe two or three years. And I started at literally one end of the, what they called the occult section back Mm -hmm. then and worked my way to the other in an attempt to try to understand the experiences that I was having because I grew up Pentecostal. So psychics and mediums and things like that were not allowed, um, in a super conservative religious family. But, um, what really sort of sent me, uh, searching more so is I started having out of body experiences and that kind of freaked me out. So I was looking for answers, but, um, to address the psychic kid portion, I've been asked that numerous times over the years, and I honestly don't remember exactly how it happened. I just remember at one point there was an email, and I must have responded to that email mm-hmm. because before I knew it, I got a response back that they wanted to come to my house with cameras for this docu series. <laughs> so, how did your Pentecostal family feel about that? Well, they didn't know till like the day before. Oh wow. <laughs> I was like, by the way, mom, camera crew's coming. We're doing a TV show, so let's clean the house. Um, but I will say, even though uh, you know, my dad's side was more agnostic, it was more my mom's side that was religious, and she was the one who sort of instilled that in us. But um, even so, both my parents, even when they didn't understand it, I think always understood that we don't know why, but he's different, mm-hmm. and he's going to do his own thing no matter what. So they're always supportive in that way. That's awesome. That's awesome. I think what happened also with me is the same sort of thing, only it didn't happen until way later in my life that I started to figure out the weird things that happened when I was young. Mm -hmm. You know, being much older than you, it was one of those things that you certainly didn't talk about, whether it involved religion or not. But you just kind of pushed it off like, this is something that I really am not going to bring up because it's just going to cause a problem. But the same thing happened when I opened up. It was people were asking the question, well, do you see this? And do you feel that? And and it's hard to explain that, no, I really don't. Right. And why this is coming to me is almost as much a surprise to me as it is to you. Right. And it's, it's like things just spew out of you that, you know, you don't even think about. Mm-hmm. So. And there's that period of, like, why me? Yeah. Because for a long time I felt like a victim of it. You know, mm-hmm. people talk about a gift, and I was like, this doesn't feel like a gift, because I feel like a freak. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I'm fortunate I haven't felt that way in a very long time, but, um, you know, sometimes it's like, well, why not me? Mm-hmm. Nowadays, well, why not me, as opposed to, why me? Like, yeah. why do I have to have this go on? Why can't I just be normal? And that's awesome. It's wonderful that you've reached that point. Yeah. And so many of our listeners, I, I think, tonight haven't reached that point. Um, and I think hearing you could could help them. What did you learn on Psychic Kids? I mean, what what was that experience like as far as at that young of an age to be thrust into the limelight like that? Psychic Kids did a lot for me, but I, I don't think in the way that most people think. Uh, you know, the basic premise of the show, you have these kids who are young who don't understand what's going on with them. Experts come in, they train them up like X-Men, and then right. everybody's happy. Um, 
But what most people don't realize is by the time I did that show, I had been already reading, uh, you know, for the public. Mm -hmm. So I'd kind of already had to figure it out for myself because it was kind of this sensation of being thrown into the deep end and having to sink or swim. So I figured it out on my, my own for the most part and learned to swim at least enough to do what I did at that point in time. What it did do for me was two things. One, it really boosted my confidence of... It was a validation Mm -hmm. that these aren't just imaginations or, you know, these are things that I can bring through that are verifiable and that can be confirmed. The other thing is that it brought um, my particular episode was geared around missing persons because I figured if I'm going to have these experiences, I want to do something with it that's helpful. So they brought in a forensic medium and we worked a case with her after the show ended. I apprenticed for about three years and she introduced me to spiritualism and which is a huge passion of mine, both as a movement, but also the history of it. Mm -hmm. And so that really kind of helped me figure out who I am. And the other thing, my teacher, her name was Gail St. John. She was originally from the Toledo area, but she lives in the Fort Wayne area. Now Um, she was a no nonsense, very tough teacher. And at that point in time, because I didn't have any formal instruction, I was very new agey because mm-hmm. that's what was available to me. So little 16 year old Travis who had hair down to here looking like hippie Jesus <laughs> um, was off with like the angels and, you know, just out there. Right. Um, and she really helped bring a certain grounded practical element that has benefited me a lot. Like focused. Very focused, very practical, very no nonsense. And I think I've grown a lot as a medium because of it. That's phenomenal. I like that you brought in the word grounded because Mm -hmm. when all of this broke loose with me, that was my big thing. And I think Nancy and Sue probably can back that up because I was all over the place. I couldn't sleep. It was like constant spirit activity Mm -hmm. and I felt like I was overwhelmed and the first thing I was told is you need to be grounded and you need to know the difference between their time and your time Mm -hmm. and you need to take control of that and I was all over the place and it wasn't until then that I was introduced to stones and crystals and which I'm still not that good with but I, I started looking for grounding stones. I started doing, you know, the Himalayan salt baths mm-hmm. and things to almost like light meditation to calm myself and separate spirit from myself. Travis, how do you ground yourself? I mean, what techniques do you use? It's really interesting. My, I mentioned my teacher, Gail, one of, you know, my mentors, and she always used to say, get grounded, get grounded, get grounded. And at that point in time, my only reference to grounding was I'm closing my eyes and I'm picturing my feet going into the ground and becoming (laughs) roots. And I was like, you mean every time you tell me I have to stop and do this whole meditation? And for me, what I found is that there's not like one particular practice or action, but for me, it's living groundedly in just a very, um, just a very basic sense. So I always say, if you have trouble staying grounded, then engage your body because that's essentially what you're sort of disconnecting from. The mind is kind of going off. So for me, I walk a lot. I can't tell you, I mean, I've killed treadmills. I, (laughs) especially when my anxiety was at all time high, uh, yoga, stretching, you know, you talked about the salt baths, anything that really brings your senses back to the physical body, I think is very grounding. The other thing is a lot of times when people find that they have a sensitivity, it's this whole new world that opens up to them and they want to live there. Mm-hmm. And we have to remember that we're body, mind, and spirit, and we have to engage the earthly stuff. And so sometimes it's just like, yeah, drink your wine, eat your chocolate, watch the Kardashians, whatever you have to do, just <laughs> engage the human experience. Right. Yeah, I think oftentimes, from what I've heard and read, as far as people coming into this or realizing they have these gifts for the first time, they can take a dangerous path mm-hmm. if, if they're not guided well, or they can, I guess, go off the deep end, per se. What advice could you give to people... Uh, 
I'm saying psychic kids be in reference because of your experience, but in the case of like Randy, who these things kind of exploded later in life, for anybody who's suddenly sensing or having these abilities, what advice can you give them to keep them away from the dark side? Sure. No, there's, I always say there's a very fine line between gifted and crazy. Mm. I believe that we can all develop spiritual gifts to a degree. Hence, you know, the title of my book, why I called it what I did. The thing is, if you are, and this is why grounding is so important. If you're doing any sort of psychic work or mediumistic experience or anything out of body, there's a, there's a disassociation that happens. It's almost like when we receive that information, we're kind of there, we're kind of not, we're sort of in between. A medium. Yeah, essentially, between. a medium. And so um, if we don't have a natural grip on reality, then the chances of us going way far out is, is exacerbated. Mm -hmm. And that's why I always say people who struggle with mental health, not that if you have, we all have mental health stuff right. from time to time. If you have, you know, severe bipolar or severe schiz you know, schizophrenic tendencies, things of that nature, opening up psychically is probably not the best idea right. for you. And I think anybody in general, we constantly have to be aware of mental issues, emotional issues, personal issues. And that's why for me, that giftedness or whatever you want to call it and spirituality go hand in hand because it's about self-work whether it's just dealing with grief or dealing with abuses that have happened just coming to terms with your own issues doesn't mean you have to fix them but if you know that they're there and you're consciously working at making it better you have a much better chance of holding on to reality as you open up to other parts of non you know things right. that I call non-reality yeah that yeah, then you can't question what you're receiving because it's non non fictionalized. Right. Um, you can then separate what is true gifts or readings that you're getting. That's right. that's happened, and I'm sure it's happened with you too. Where people will approach. It happened to me on a couple of different occasions where people approach me and they'll say, "I think I'm a medium," or "I think I'm a sensitive," and they'll start explaining things to me and. I don't know if it's part of my gift or not, but I'll I'll right away start to think they have way deeper issues than this, yeah. and this is way over their head. And I really want to try to say, well, I'm not so sure that's what's happening with you, and try to you know back them out of it because I don't think they can handle it. Absolutely. You know, there are times where, especially like I teach my intuitive development classes, and there are certain people who, if if they signed up for my class, I would probably seriously have to have a conversation with them before I would feel comfortable. Um, because I've had a particular experience of someone who, seemingly normal individual, mm -hmm. um, opened up without a lot of discernment and I think very much lost touch with reality. And uh, it was kind of a sad thing to witness. That would, that, you know, and I think that would be terrible because if I was in your shoes, and you probably do, that's a huge responsibility for you. Absolutely. You know, as a teacher or a mentor, if you're teaching a class, I, I, I and I can only imagine, like yourself, you wouldn't want to be responsible for that. Absolutely. And that would have to really be hard. How do you break that kind of news to somebody, though? <laughs> no, unfortunately, unfortunately, I haven't had to do much of that. I, I mean, I have, with my personal clients, a lot of times people will come in and they think they like to... Sh I can always tell who's pretty genuine, mm -hmm. genuinely gifted versus maybe those who aren't because the ones who are, I'm usually telling them, and the ones who aren't are the ones who are telling me mm -hmm. that they're gifted or special. Right. Um, and so in my private sessions, I'll get those people sometimes where it's like, yeah, okay, you know, <laughs> if you like it, I love it. But um, fortunately with my classes, I haven't had to deal a lot with that. And I also think too, as a teacher, not only is, is it my job to give you the information and guide you to open up correctly, but if you've ever seen me do a class, when they're going through exercises or I'm leading exercises, I'm walking around the room um, and I'm observing and I'm not really listening to what they're saying or what they're doing. I'm watching the energy mm -hmm. because I want to make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing or that there's no influence that's not supposed to be influencing them to make sure that things go correctly. Yeah, that makes sense. It's happened to me and I, I'm sure it's probably happened to you too. When you're doing a reading, mm -hmm. a one-on-one, -on -one, 
and people are grasping. They really want to know something. And you're kind of picking it up, but you feel like it's not something you need to share with them. Mm -hmm. Like it, it's not life threatening, but it's something that you feel in your heart they need to experience. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to give them too much so that they don't experience it. How do you handle that? I, I mean, I, I have my own little way of handling it, but how do you handle it? In the sense of, I guess maybe can you give like an example? If, if you, in your feeling about what's going on in their life or their, their future, there's a bump in the road, like, mm. you know, maybe in a relationship type situation that there's going to be, you know, a, a slip up of an affair or something like that. I sometimes feel like if it's not going to be disastrous, that I don't want to bring that up to them because I feel like it's something that maybe they need to experience in their in their journey, I guess you'd say. Understood. Um, there's a couple different ways I think people view that. And for me, it's it's not like one set way. It's really like in this moment, this particular circumstance, what do I feel is best? Some people are of the mindset of you always, if you perceive it, you give it period, no matter what. Uh, and I tend to lean on that side. However, just because you know something, you know, I always try to run it through. Is it helpful? Is it, you know, is it, is it of importance for them to know? Um, and if it is, if I say, okay, I'm not sure about this. I might check with my guide or helper who works with me. Do, do I, do I really need to share this? If it is something that I feel like I need to share, then how can I word it or cushion it in a way that still gives the truth of the information without either setting them up for self-fulfilling prophecy or Harming making them, them yeah. just go off on the wrong path because they want to avoid this thing that's mm -hmm. a necessary part of their lesson. And that's, I think that's probably the best way to describe it. I, I kind of do the same thing. I, I don't want to say I don't always avoid telling them. I just, you know, like sidestep the issue <laughs> right. and give them the the good part and and hope that they can handle the bad part. <laughs> right, right. Or sometimes two people use the sandwich technique. I'll give you the good thing, slip that and maybe not so great thing in the middle, and then we'll end on a good note. <laughs> yeah. Hey, if it works. Um, but that would have to be tough. I mean, I, I can only imagine, you know, to, to sit down and give someone a reading and, and seeing things that you're not sure how they're going to react to it. Um, you know, we also saw in your bio too about quantum life coach. Mm -hmm. Um, can you elaborate just a little bit on that for me? <laughs> sure. No, um, quantum life coach was a term that was coined by Sandra Ann Taylor. She, um, she's an author. She writes a lot about natural law and, um, success and and using energy to be the best you that you can be and so when she uses the term uh, quantum life coach she just means quantum in the sense of traditional life coaching addresses maybe your your attitude your emotions and mm -hmm. then you have people who focus on physical wellness hers is we're addressing all par all parts all portions so we're looking at that subtle part the energetic part that most people don't address and so um, there were different techniques within that under that training under that umbrella both in the sense of understanding the energetic body things like um how past life vows and contracts can affect us today and then also a technique that she sort of pioneered called um, um, coding and decoding which is very mm -hmm. similar to uh, neuro-linguistic programming to sort of create new pathways that support healthier ways. And with that it is time for break and we will be back.
Don't let the negativity of today's world get you sidetracked from your life's journey. Visit It's Your Journey Metaphysical Store at 4750 Cleveland Road East in Huron, Ohio. It's Your Journey is more than a store. It's a place of healing and knowledge. It's Your Journey carries a wide variety of healing crystals and protection stones, salt lamps, books, incense, candles, essential oils, and more. It's Your Journey also offers Reiki, energy healing, personal readings, spirit releasement, and soul retrieval. Live out of the area? No problem. Visit It's Your Journey's website at itsyourjourney.com and shop online. Shipping available worldwide or call 419-433-0888. Don't let negative energy stop you. Take charge. It's your journey. And welcome back to Paranormal Road. Travis, um, I want to talk to you a little bit about spirit guides. Okay. okay. Um, I have to be really honest and frank when... Uh, just uh, not too many years ago, um, maybe 10 years ago, if somebody started talking about spirit guides, I would start laughing with my inside voice, <laughs> um, thinking, uh, okay, they're out there, they're a little bit strange, um, because I just didn't believe in spirit guides. I mean, I, I am no longer like that. I, I, I know there's something, mm -hmm. and I don't know why I'm, I'm still a little bit hesitant to refer to Alfred, who is the entity that I have made contact with, as my guide, and I'm sure he is. But I, I don't know what they are, so I'm hesitant to, to do that. Um, also, I'm a little bit leery, as you know, with the research in the paranormal. I'm a little bit, uh, I guess, on guard to strike up a relationship with an entity that I don't really know who or what it is. How did you handle, number one, the introduction to your spirit guide? Sure. And, and what exactly do you think they are? So to me, I perceive spirit guides as souls who kind of have our back when we decide to take on an incarnation. Different people will argue about whether guides are assigned to us or whether we choose them or whether we attract mm -hmm. them and i think a little bit of all three is probably true um but to me i don't some people really get caught up on this idea of like guides and angels and i'll be very honest i'm not an, an i'm not an angel person mm -hmm. um i think it, it's it's a it boils down to semantics if you know if it helps people to think of this as a guardian angel as opposed to a a soul that has lived life on earth, then that's entirely up to them. But um, to me, if someone is in spirit and they're bringing you guidance, they're a spirit guide. Whether they were there from the time we were born or we attracted them or it's a family member, they're bringing you guidance that's a spirit guide. Um, in Like in spiritualism, they have different types of guides that mm -hmm. they like to categorize some people say you only have one guide some people say that you have multiple guides based I upon your need at that time of life or absolutely an interest you may like if you want to play piano a guide may come in to help you during that that phase in your life where you wanted to learn piano right absolutely so okay. like in spiritualism we call but we have our inner band guides and our outer band guides. Our inner band guides are the ones that are with us most of the time. Some people say your entire life. And then those outer band guides are the ones that come in to either help with a specific situation or you have an interest. Say you're an artist, so you may attract other artists from the spirit world mm -hmm. who can assist you in your art. Uh, I came to know the very first guide that I worked with through the process of automatic writing. And I'm not... I'm not... In, entirely impatient. It's not a practice that I do a lot today because I don't have the patience for it. <laughs> um, but I remember for probably a couple weeks, I would sit every day and just put my hand on the paper and just say, okay, I'd really like to know my spirit guide. Please, br you know, bring them through. Let yourself be known to me. And for the longest time, it was just scribbles and scribbles and scribbles. And then finally, one day, my hand wrote a name. And it wasn't a name I was familiar with. And so I always say, test, test the spirit, test mm -hmm. spirit. Um, and that name in three separate ways within a matter of days popped up. 
afterwards a sort of confirmation of like randomly that. randomly okay. yeah the, the name signs. the name that i wrote at the time was actually celeste mm -hmm. and i'd never heard that name before and then you know i was at a, a grocery store and there was a baby name booklet up by the register and the page that i opened to was celeste which meant heavenly and it's like mm -hmm. okay that's one there were things like that that kept happening for me when it comes to spirit guides, or if you start to feel like there's a spirit energy who's working with you, but you're not sure or wanting to contact you, I always say, uh, look at it from two different ways. One, you can always tell a tree by the fruit it bears. If the information is loving, supportive, encouraging, um, then I think you can feel pretty comfortable trusting mm -hmm. that. If at any time something is telling you, to do something, to not do something, instilling fear or going the other way and blowing your head up with grandeur, then you might want to take a step back because it might just be your imagination or maybe not such an enlightened soul. But, um, you know, we were talking about natural law during break. And I always say, too, I don't ever really worry too much about protection. And I don't ever worry about, for me personally, encountering anything ugly, so to speak. Granted, you're hesitant to use the word demonic, aren't you? Yeah, I don't like the yeah. word just because it's <laughs> it's it's not an experience that I have. And part of it is because I only deal with people who've crossed over into the light. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I don't deal with earthbound. I don't do the paranormal stuff just because I have found my lane and I like my lane. And so right. I don't I don't go anywhere else with it. Um, but with natural law, you know, we, we talk about like energies attracting like energy. So for me, like the bulk of my work is primarily one-on-ones with clients. I choose to work from a space of love. Therefore, I know that I can never experience anything else back other than that. That's a good thought. Yeah. Uh, that's, I, I, I like that. I, I think that that's very wise because it's kind of like... It's traveling the path you want to... Yeah travel and it's not veering off that path and it's not inviting anything in that you don't want and that's not to say that other kinds of work like what you guys do right. isn't important or any less because um you know there's always people who are in that place who need a light out of right. it so, you know whether it's just confirmation that they're not crazy or there being an energy in the home that we need right. to move on so for whatever facet or whatever lane that you're in i think there's there's work to be done there and that's not to be discredited right. either i guess you'd say we're trying to put them in your lane <laughs> yeah you're trying to get them over to where they can talk to me <laughs> well i think too it, it, for me personally with um alfred okay um with itc's the the guy that came through with EVP, I started getting his voice, and he started, and it was not, nothing ever demonic, it was nothing hateful, but he was saying things, and like, okay, this must be what they call a spirit guide. So mm -hmm. I was referring to him, and then finally one day, I said, uh, you know, can you tell me your name? And when he, I got back out, I busted out laughing. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you couldn't have a cool name? You know? Right, right. And, and um, all of a sudden, it hit me as to why, um, because when I was a kid growing up, Batman and Robin was like my favorite show, and I loved the butler, Alfred. He reminded me of my grandfather. Mm. So I, looking back, I don't know if that thought came to me because he put that thought in me so I'd understand it. I'm not even sure that his name is Alfred, okay, that he's just chosen that so I can relate to him. Exactly. See, the thing I found, spirit guides don't care. We like that stuff right. because it helps us define things and clarify things. I call my guide Thomas, um, the primary guide who I work with in doing message work. Mm -hmm. um, but for a lot of people, you know, imagine that you have this assignment to guide someone who literally ignores you for 30, 40, 50 years. Yeah. Yeah. And But you know that there's this aspect where if they become open to the idea, for example, everyone loves a good Native American spirit guide. Mm -hmm. Or you go to a reader and they tell you you have a Native American spirit guide. Well, regardless of whether they're Native American or not, if you're adamant that that's, the, that's who they are, they will absolutely use that imagery or the name or whatever just because, hey, this is what it takes to get this person to listen. So even if his name, when he lived on Earth or wherever he may be from, isn't Alfred but that was in there, mm -hmm. he'll utilize that and he'll be offered from this day forward. Right. And in every investigation, we get, you know, uh, evidence of spirits communicating with him. He's actually, uh, he encourages them to pray, to tell us to pray, uh, to, oh, to, you know, um, and, and he's the, like the middleman between them and us. And it's, 
I mean, we have actually had them say, thank you, Alfred. I mean, uh, things that we're picking up, it's just kind of mind-blowing. It's like he's coaching them yeah. crossover. See, that's really interesting. And a lot of times, too, I say people, um, your spirit guides are kind of like the medium for the medium. They're mm. like the, the deceased version or the non-physical version of a medium because uh, that's what a spirit guide does. In the old days of spiritualism, like with mediumship now, we think that we talk directly to the spirits, and most mediums right. work that way. In the old days, the spirit would communicate to the spirit guide, the spirit guide would communicate it to the medium, then the medium would communicate it to the sitter. So they were essentially both doing the job. One just was in the body, the other wasn't. Now, speaking of that, and uh, um, looking back at spiritualism, the heyday, which to me was just fascinating. It, the whole time period just uh, is amazing. You look at some of the photos on there in the ectoplasma. Mm -hmm. Have you ever witnessed any of that, or have you ever channeled to that kind of degree? I have. So my first teacher, Gail, who I was talking about that introduced me to spiritualism, um, she was a remarkable trance medium. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't necessarily say she was a physical medium, but there were instances where I have seen ectoplasm in a, a very... Uh, gaseous vaporous state right. mm -hmm. during her trance sessions um it was never the more solid versions that you get with a lot of the physical phenomena seances like back in the old days i have witnessed however in uh dark room seance conditions physical phenomena where i i I'm not sure if you're familiar with trumpet mediumship mm -hmm. okay so um in the circle um you know, the trumpets levitated, spirit lights were flying around the room. We were having full-blown conversations with voices through the trumpet, just like I was wow. having with you. It was honestly a life-changing experience. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And, and honestly, listeners, I can say that, and Randy can say it, when you, like just with what we do, ITC, when you're communicating, you get direct answers. You know, the critics will laugh or they'll say we're nuts and, and say it's crazy, but the people who actually, you know, we've even had people who doubted us yeah. sit in on a session or be a part of it and something happens real time. Mm -hmm. And you can just see the instant that they change their mind about their feeling. Yeah. When it's, they it's get awesome. something yeah. that is validating or true in the moment, they will change their mind in a heartbeat. Right. That, hey, this isn't a bunch of garbage. This is real. And that's exactly what, for me, who's not, didn't experience what you did growing up, mm -hmm. I've always wanted to believe, I always thought, you know, I, I, man, it would be awesome, but to actually have the first EVP, to actually have that first voice that I know darn well, there was nobody in that room other than uh, Randy and I at the time, Right. and I was talking to him, and this spirit comes back in and says, that's right. And, and it's like, whoa, who said that? It wasn't you, it wasn't me, you know? And there was no explanation for that. Absolutely. And then to, to witness this time and time again, um, to me, it's I, how people cannot find that so incredibly amazing or wondrous is beyond me. Absolutely. And that had to be what it was like for you in that seance. I, I mean, I, at the time, this was only a few years ago, so I'd kind of been around the block in the metaphysical circle for a yeah. while, and... But at the end of that initial seance, I luckily have sat in on several others with that particular uh, group of mediums, but um, my mind was just blown. Mm -hmm. And I was like a, a kid on Christmas. I didn't. I don't think I slept that whole night. Like an adrenaline rush. Absolutely. <laughs> exactly. Absolutely. You've been there, yeah. Yeah, when you get like anything that's so out there that just becomes valid and you can't ignore it at all, it, it's, it's just cool. Um... Not that I want to go back to the dark side, but because um, I know there are listeners out here, you know, they're listening to us. Um, have you had, or can you share in the early stages something that may have been terrifying for you, an experience, and how did you handle it? And sure. Um, I've only had one experience, because I'm, like I said, I, I deal with, humans that have gone to the light that's primarily the lane that i stick to i had one experience with something that uh really kind of stuck with me that didn't quite fit into that box um i don't know maybe 10 years ago i used to work with a paranormal group actually mm -hmm. um from my hometown and they would go in from a 
techie perspective. I would go in from a spiritual perspective and we'd kind of compare notes after and that sort of thing. We were doing a house one time and sometimes before an investigation, I would start to pick up just certain things, whether not even necessarily spirit, sometimes just facts or images of the house or whatever ahead of time. And every time that I, I would think about going to this house, I would just see a shadow. And I had, I used to wear 24 uh, seven, a St. Michael pendant back in the day, back in my hippie days. Um, <laughs> I never took it off. And I remember I used to work at, in retail at the time. And that investigation was that night after it had been rescheduled before because of issues. So it seemed like something didn't want us to be there. Um, so I was standing there thinking about it. And at the time, my necklace just, the chain just fell off onto the ground where I had never taken it off before. So I was prepared to fully encounter something that I, you know, yeah. just not great. And we get there and um, the house was, it felt wonderful. Like nothing there until we went outside. There was actually a historian who was part of the team. And in this particular area, there was a lot of uh, indigenous people back, you know, before it was settled. And so there were mounds, burial mounds, which sounds incredibly cliche. Oh. And as he was outside, he was sort of um, doing some sort of pipe ceremony. I kept seeing this figure, not with my eyes, but internally, as most of my perceptions are, he would look like a man. And then he would kind of, his face would change a little bit and he kind of looked like man coyote-ish. And it just kind of weirded me out. I didn't know what to make of it. We go inside they finish up their investigation we would always end with some sort of a prayer and as i'm doing this prayer one of our team members starts just moaning in pain as if she had been punched in the gut oh. and at that point everyone had headaches everyone wanted to leave and we got out of there and while i'm doing the prayer i'm thinking well if this is something not so nice uh, you know i if if i f keep going is it going to hurt her or if i stop is that going right. to allow it to keep doing what it's doing um and later I talked to some people who historically understood the area better. And f I honestly don't know what to make of it. But from the imagery that I described, they talked about um, the lore of the skinwalker. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking that. that's, you know, like I said, it's not something that I know a lot of, but it was definitely the one experience that doesn't necessarily fit into my box. Yeah. And that's scary. But, you know, it's really when you would describe that's so amazing because we had one case and as you were describing how you pick up things before, mm -hmm. and it's the only time, and unfortunately, this was one of five cases we believe were demonic or non-human. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> you can appreciate this being part of that team, but we used to bug them all the time. Are you getting anything, Randy? Okay. What are you picking yeah. up? And in this particular instance, you can you could describe it, what was happening. And this was in Pennsylvania. But somehow this entity knew we were coming mm -hmm. and knew where to find him. It, it was, you know, the same situation. I start picking things up prior to. And like you said, it'll, it isn't necessarily spirit. It, it's facts. It's things that are happening. You know, the, where you're going, the location. And I kept picking up bits and pieces of the property and the location. And I was describing the house and even how it sat on the landscape and things. But when I would start to get a lot of detail, it was like a, a black cloth or something was thrown over my face. Like, mm -hmm. I, like it was just gone. And I'd have to just like think through it, calm down, and then refocus, and it would start up again. And I would start to see something else, and then here goes the black cloth again. Was right. that how it was for you? Like you were being blocked? I, I guess in a way it kind of was like being blocked. Um, and maybe it was myself and that once I saw that, I just kind of had like a, a what the hell sort of moment that I didn't think past it. Yeah. But it just sort of seemed like everything was resistant to us being there. And even after the fact of reflecting on everything that had taken place, I, I don't know in that particular instance that whatever energy or being that was, I don't know so much that it was evil or demonic, but it was definitely one of those things where it's this, I command a certain amount of respect. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that the situations or the people who were there were respecting the fact that it had been there long before they were. 
Now, your guides, do they, I mean, like if you go into a location, do you have spirits that are trying to get your attention? No, actually, um, you know, only those that have crossed over. Well, one, only those that have crossed over. Two, I've kind of trained myself just so I don't burn out or go off the deep end of when I'm in the office and I decide to be on, the open sign is there. And then if I'm not, you know, the minute that I walk out, we're closed for business. So it's funny because I just mentioned that in one of our other episodes where yeah. Dave asked me about, you know, letting by appointment only. In, and I said it's by appointment only, Absolutely. living or dead. Because they're pushing. If yeah, you right. don't set those boundaries, they'll bug you all the it's, time. It's your turn when I say it is. Absolutely. Well, we will be back. I can't believe how fast this time is going. Super um, fast. Yes, it is. So uh, stay with us, folks, and we'll be more uh, or have more with Travis when we return from the break. And we're back in the studio with Travis Sanders. And Travis, we want to ask you a little bit about past life regression. Okay. So for me, past life regression was something that I had an interest in probably in high school. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, growing up in the Pentecostal faith, we would have uh, reincarnation as part of our belief system. But it was something that very much intrigued me and kind of uh, prompted me to not only learn about it and and, uh, try to take myself through it, but I also... if I'm sorry, if I can interrupt, did did it intrigue you just because you found it intriguing or was there a sense in you being a medium did you feel there that you've done this before this isn't your first rodeo i think it was very much that Mm -hmm. and and i've always felt um just very much uh, you know even as a little kid i was always i wanted to be with the adults i never related to kids my own age people would say things like you know you're an old soul Mm -hmm. um but I always just felt like uh, very connected to the past. I've always felt very connected to different points in history. And that, that kind of made me want to investigate that a little bit more. So I would try things like um, regression CDs and things of that nature. And yet, when it's something that you're trying to do for yourself, you don't trust it as much right. as maybe if someone else takes you through it. So the more that I learned about it, I would actually use my friends as guinea pigs. And up in my bedroom at 16, I was like tinkering around with their subconscious before I actually knew what I was doing. And fortunately, nothing Now that's what you call true friendship. Yeah, if you can't exactly. mess with your friends, who can you mess with? Are they listening now? Uh, they might be. And, you know, fortunately, I never had an experience of that going wrong because it yeah. very well could have. You have. Now that I'm older and I've learned in more of a... Um, legitimate way the mechanics of hypnosis and the structure of the mind you can have experiences like ab reactions where a person is re-traumatized so mm-hmm. i was very fortunate that one i had good guinea pigs two is probably by the grace of god and nothing nothing <laughs> happened but um you know as we were talking about on break um i don't do as much of the past life stuff anymore and part of it was because some people were just coming out of curiosity's sake And that's fine, but when I do past life regressions, the ones that to me are the most interesting are ones that explore patterns. And so I always tell people, one of the best times to seek past life um, insight is if you have an issue that's chronic in your life, and you've tried all the other conventional ways of addressing it, and nothing is shifting or changing, then there's a strong possibility that the root cause of that belief system, issue, illness, could actually stem into a past life. 
For example, I think I get what you're saying. Um, for example, let's say I have a fear of ships. Mm-hmm. I, you know, don't want to go on a cruise ship. I don't want to even look at a freighter on Lake Erie. Um, and I've never been able to explain this fear. And it's actually, I can't even take a trip, let's say, to... This isn't real, folks, by the way. I'm just <laughs> hypothetically speaking. But I couldn't get on the Jet Express because of fear of, of boats. Could that have a link to maybe a, a traumatic event in a past life? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, even things that are benign, like, for example... Um, you know, someone having a silver allergy and they have a regression and find that they died in a silver mine in Mm. the 1700s or, you know, there's all sorts of things. And the other thing that's kind of interesting is sometimes the age at which these traumas come about, because it's usually not something that's always been there. It just kind of comes out of the blue at a certain point in a person's life without explanation. It's irrational, often corresponds to the age in that previous lifetime when the incident or the event occurred, yeah. And that makes a lot of sense. What are some of your interesting, um, that you could share, of course, from your clients without revealing names? Is there any stories you can tell us that surprised even you that you found fascinating? Hmm. You know, I've been pretty, um, I've had pretty much, I don't want to say boring experiences, but a lot (laughs) of times, you know, people think that, um, I don't, I don't know what they think. They think that it's going to be sort of this, they were a king or a queen or, you know, all sorts of stuff. And most of the time it's like, no, you were the peasant <laughs> who had gingivitis and died because you got kicked by a mule. Um, it's usually not super right. interesting stuff. However, you brought up something a little earlier, um, talking about life between life stuff. Mm-hmm. And one of my interests uh, that I'm, I'm very intrigued by is this concept of the Akashic Records. Yes. And a lot of times, and so this might be how I shift my approach moving forward with past life work, instead of taking a person through a regression, accessing those records of their soul's history. And do you think your guide can help you do that? Do you think the guides come in to help give you that access to the Akashic Records? Absolutely. I absolutely think that, makes that a lot of sense. when we work with the Akashic Records that there are not only are personal guides, but I do think that there are souls who sort of maybe oversee that information that can help us navigate and find mm-hmm. what we're looking for. Um, and to me, that's just maybe a little bit less messy than actual regression. Now, how do you feel about soul groups uh, and the concept that we come back like a cluster of grapes? Um, we come back in clusters um, over and over again, like cl- like a class sharing experiences i actually i really think there's a lot of credibility to that um one of the things people ask and i was just teaching a a mediumship intensive this past weekend someone said well what if you can't get a communication with someone because they've reincarnated and i said i've never had that experience not saying that it can't happen but i've never had that experience and i think it's because as soul groups we tend to cycle with the same souls playing different roles to each other and then we all wait till everyone's right. back before we start to, to review come back in what again. we've all learned exactly now I, I know there's been many theories and from what i if i'm not mistaken the the leading theory seems to be that it's between 75 to 100 years between cycles now it doesn't mean that if I died tomorrow, within a year, I couldn't reincarnate. Right. Uh, there are some exceptions in our uh, individuals that uh, reincarnate that quickly. But from my understanding, they it seems to be 75 to 100 years is the average. And that would make sense because that would be a generational lifespan right. of a cluster of souls right. I- I sharing the experience. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Um I don't know that I have a, a fixed belief system as to a general time period or a general time frame. Um I do think that there is probably quite a bit more time than people think, you know, between right. lifetimes. And the other thing is some people get over there and they're like, yeah, but no, I'm not doing that again. <laughs> yeah. I don't blame them, especially where I see where the world's going today. It was, it's bad. It was bad the first time. <laughs> right. um, how do you, I mean, you yourself had had a regression or you just tried to do it yourself? So I would do like uh, hypnosis CDs or mm-hmm. guided guided scripts, guided imagery. And this is one of the other things where I've kind of backed off the past life regression work is because the subconscious is an incredibly powerful thing. And I sometimes I believe that the 
core essence or teaching of what a past life regression reveals might be true, but sometimes our, I think our mind may create the Fabricate. scenario right. to get us to that point. And so um, for me personally, the experience where I feel I've had a legitimate insight into a past life of mine has not been in sort of a, a regressed state, but for me has been triggered by I'm doing something and it triggers almost like a spontaneous memory. And those right. to me feel more real. And I trust those more than maybe some things from being in an altered state. Right. Makes sense. And it wouldn't really be, you know, when people say to me, deja vu, is mm -hmm. it like deja vu? I guess you could say kind of, mm -hmm. but I guess on a much bigger scale because you're, you're regressing back. It's not just something that you, oh, I think I saw that before. Oh, I think that happened to me before. Right. And, you know, but I do get that a lot with people asking me the question, well, did all of this start with, you know, like deja vu? It's like, well, no, maybe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it depends on how they ask. And when you're looking at, too, like we talked about the soul groups, mm -hmm. um, there's a handful of people in my life that I have met, not of family that within moments of meeting them, I can't explain it, yep. but it's like, I don't want to use the term soulmate because it doesn't necessarily mean in a romantic way, but there are certain people, and like I said, it's like a handful, yeah. cause it's like, I have known this person before. I've known them and you just fit, you gel so well. Absolutely. That it's hard for me to fathom any other explanation other than a past life connection right. to that per person right no absolutely i i like what you said with bringing up soulmates because to me that's that really is what it is but people have that idea that soulmate has to be a romantic right. no. so a lot of times i just say this person's kindred meaning yeah. that we know each other from some other time some other place right sharing the journey together Ab yeah. absolutely Travis, I understand you have a new book coming out and you know without giving away everything about it because you know of course we want people to read it Tell us a little bit about it. So the new book that's coming is called Practical Mediumship. I'm really, not that I'm not proud of the other things that I've done, but I'm really proud of this particular project because for the past two or three years, I've really put a lot of um, my passion and, and my soul into it because of all the things that I do, uh, the mediumship is something that I could talk for days about. Mm -hmm. And um, so Practical Mediumship really teaches people that developing your ability to connect with spirit is your birthright because you are spirit. Therefore, it's your birthright to be able to communicate to some degree with spirit. And it doesn't have to be this woo-woo mystical process. It's It can be a very down-to-earth thing. And I write very much in the way that I teach, which is the other big passion that I have next to spiritualism and its history is I love teaching even more than my one-on-one -on -one clients. And I love my clients, but when I'm teaching, I'm in my happy place. And as a teacher, I'm very nuts and bolts. I'm not mm -hmm. flowery. I don't want to waste a lot of your time with anecdotes. I want to get right into the mechanics of it and get into the doing of it. So that's a lot of what this next book is about. That's great. When when do you think it's going to be out there for everybody? Uh, definitely by summer, but I'm, I'm hoping for uh, earlier than that at... Right. Uh, I'll definitely keep you guys posted. And we will definitely let everybody know. Absolutely. And it's, you know, as you're talking about your new book and spiritualism, I, I, I couldn't help but wonder, we just got off the subject about reincarnation. Mm -hmm. And look at where you work at and the area you live in. Yeah. The birthplace or one of the birthplaces of spiritualism, at least in Ohio, was huge. And I'm just wondering if there isn't a reincarnation connection with your fascination for spiritualism there. I, I have a suspicion. I don't know for certain, but I, even as a little kid, even before I knew I was a medium, um, I've always had this really strong pull to the Victorian era. Mm -hmm. Just the architecture, the, the everything. It just uh, it felt familiar to me. And so um, when I started researching spiritualism and, and knowing more about spiritualism as a movement, and then digging into Ohio's history and how Ohio played such a crucial role at, you know, at one point in the, in the uh, mid 1800s, one in 10 people in the United States identified as a spiritualist. Which is amazing when you look at 
the Christianity and the religion, uh, religious atmosphere of the United States at that time, exactly. that spiritualism even had a chance in this country. Exactly. It, it's mind-boggling. And um, so especially, you know, I lived in Berlin Heights for some time, and, and one of the most unknown but yet important figures of spiritualism was Hudson Tuttle, who mm-hmm. lived in Berlin Heights. Um, he was the inventor of the psychograph, which was a, a little device used to communicate with spirits. And he held uh, seances all over the area, Berlin Heights. There was also two in spiritualism. We have what's called the Lyceum, well, had what was called the Lyceum movement, which was kind of like the spiritualist version of Sunday school. So there was a Lyceum in Milan, Ohio, that he and his wife were sort of in charge of. Mm -hmm. And then Cleveland was very much a hotbed, too. The Fox sisters came to to Cleveland. There were spiritual spiritualist conventions in Cleveland. But um, that history uh, of Tuttle, you know, he wrote so much and did so much, both he and his wife, that they started the very first... um, spiritualist publishing company and there were also some really interesting ties to his home of friends and family Mm -hmm. that there's like very few degrees of separation so it is interesting and maybe there is sort of a past life yeah like uh maybe you were part of that movement i mean because brolin heights was huge again in the spiritualism now wasn't tuttle and his device wasn't it a precursor wasn't that didn't that precede the Ouija board? I do believe so. It, it, um, the device itself kind of looked like the planchet of a Ouija board, and it would have sort of a, a free-moving dial in the center mm-hmm. with letters around the edge. And so in a circle or a seance, we'd concentrate mental energy upon it and allow spirit to move it. But I do believe you're right. I do believe that it predated the spirit board. Now, you bring up seance because my team will probably scream, especially if Gary Jones was here, uh, <laughs> who used to be our uh, spiritual advisor and, and still is from time to time. Is, uh, but um, seances, are they dangerous? As long as there's common sense, no. Okay. Um, to me, the word, you have to kind of break it down to. Seance is French, and it simply means sitting. So when uh, you have a private reading with a psychic, you technically had a seance. Hmm. And for me, it kind of goes back to that natural law. Like if I'm sitting in a circle, a group, a one-on-one setting, I'm setting an intention to set with the best and highest good. I have my guides and helpers who I have a familiar relationship with that won't let anything happen. And we're seeking connections based on love. Therefore, that's the experience that we get in return. I think where people have issues are, are instances where teenagers, for example, they want they want to get scared, they want to prove something, and so they're just flinging open the doors, and they're getting exactly what they're asking for, and I think that's when maybe, you know, you get like into the, some of the issues. the old Ouija, Ouija uh, slumber party. Yeah, exactly. You know, where they're just, yeah, giggling, and that's when you have all the problems come in. Yeah, I think if you approach spirit with common sense, then for the most part, you really don't have anything to worry about. It is that time for a break again already. Hard to believe. We will be back after these messages. Paranormal Road is proud to announce the Haddock's Report. On special assignment for Paranormal Road, professional UFO investigator... William Haddox will be on our show periodically with breaking UFO-related news around the world. You can expect to be kept up to date on recent sightings, crop circles, cattle mutilations, strange sounds, official government statements, and more. The Haddox Report, only on Paranormal Road. And we're back on Paranormal Road. Travis, we can't thank you enough for being on, you know, in studio with us tonight. And how can people get in touch with you? Um, tell us a little bit about your website, uh, maybe some events you got coming up or where they can actually meet you in person. Um, yeah, give us the gamut. Sure. So... Uh, I am a bit of a social media junkie, so if there's a social media platform, you can kind of find me on there for the most part. Um, My website is PsychicTravisSanders.com. 
All my information for classes and readings are on there. Um, I also put a lot of videos on there as well because I'm very big in educating people as well as mm-hmm. just providing services for them. Uh, on my, my Facebook, which is just facebook.com slash psychic Travis Sanders, like my website, I do every Monday a, it's usually about an hour long class on uh, spiritual development. And so each week has a different topic and we wow, just kind of awesome. go through and I, I give, I try to give a lot of information and then also take people through the practices as well. Because a lot of times people contact me and they say, you know, I want to develop spiritually or intuitively or psychically, but I don't have a teacher or there's not a metaphysical center near me or I don't have a spiritualist church or what do I do? And so for me, it's almost like a virtual version of a development circle. Mm -hmm. And so not only am I giving you information, but I'm also taking you through the practices, the meditations, because, and, and I myself had this issue when I was younger and I was trying to figure things out and, and take myself through these processes that I would read. I couldn't sort of self navigate as easily, like read the book. Okay. This I'm supposed to visualize this and go here and do that. And then it didn't work the same as having someone take you through it. So I always like to take people through it. And that way I know that it's, it's being done safely. And they can do that by going to your Facebook page. Absolutely. So that's, now is that a group page? Do they have to be invited or all they have to do is when they go to, it'll just say Travis Sanders, clairvoyant medium, and they just have to like it. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe if they click the follow, um, like specifically the follow button, they'll get a notification anytime that I go live. Great. But other than that, it's every Monday at seven, like clockwork. And then I also put all of the archives of those classes on YouTube. So if you miss it, you can go back and catch the class and take it at your own pace. Um, I work out of a metaphysical shop called It's Your Journey in Huron. I'm there quite a bit. And uh, it's also the, the primary place where I see my in-person clients and I do my classes. This coming month, I believe the class I have, have going on is called Energy Management for Sensitive People. And I cannot tell you how many clients I've had over the years where they say, I pick up stuff, I can't control it, I'm overwhelmed by crowds, I suffer with anxiety, which is a common thread amongst Mm -hmm. genuinely sensitive people anxiety so we're going to be talking about how do we deal with that tools to get a grip on that and then understanding how we have a choice as to how affected or not affected we are by energy and how to get in the mindset where we can enforce that choice so we're not victims of our empathy we're victims of our sensitivity and uh this will be the first time i've actually done that class so i'm pretty excited to teach that and It might offend some people because I know one of the things that I'm going to be talking about is my dislike for the term empath and why Mm -hmm. I dislike the term empath, but people love that word. So, um, why do you dislike that term? (laughs) Because it's become so popular that everybody and their brother is an empath. Worn it out. Yeah. It's, it's just, it's done. Um, and you know, the other thing too is, do I believe people are empathic? Absolutely. However, it's not a it's it's not a Star Trek superpower. Right. Everyone has empathy to some degree, and I almost feel like being human. It's it's part being of this human. need for a lot of people to feel special. Or yeah, unique. but being human makes you somewhat of an empath. Absolutely, you, it's your humanity. Yeah, absolutely. Unless you're a sociopath, we can all have <laughs> empathic input to a degree. Um, so we'll talk about that. And uh, so I'm really excited for that class. I'm trying to think of some other things. You know, I'm on Instagram. I don't Twitter. But um, who knows? That may change. My book, I Am Psychic, So Are You, that's on Amazon. And we also sell that so at It's Your Journey. It through it's Your Journey on the website. Yep. On the uh, It's Your Journey website as well if you're not local to there. And then, um, as I said. Again, I just want to clarify too. It's Your Journey ships worldwide. So if you're listening to us in Australia or even if you have questions uh, for Travis, uh, email him. Absolutely. Email me. Um, you know, a big bulk of my work is by phone, and I actually love it because unlike being in the office where you have to be fully clothed, I can be on the couch in pajamas and, <laughs> and talking to you in, you know, Australia. I've had clients in New Zealand or the Ukraine or whatever. Um, and sometimes I think phone readings are more fun for me because I'm not distracted by what you look like or your facial reactions to something that I say. Right. And sometimes I'll even like, damn, 
I surprised myself. You know, <laughs> that that the came old shit moment. The old shit moment. Yeah, the old shit moment. So phone ratings are really fun for me. And, um, you know, geographically, we're not limited in any way. And I'm trying to think of anything else that might be pertinent to share that's coming up. But I'm also very... One of the things I try to be is very down to earth and very approachable. And so, you know, never hesitate to get a hold of me, whether it be for a service or I'm a big person on giving people references. I'm interested in this. I don't know where to go. As someone who read a little bit of everything, even if it's not an area of expertise for me, I can probably know of someone or something that I can point you in the direction with to kind of help you on whatever your path might be. Now, let's say... uh someone calls it your journey there's a good likelihood your answer the phone yeah right? they would probably get me and you would be able to help guide them like if they're calling on a question on a specific topic you'd be able to point them in the right direction as far as that if you could not help them yourself correct? absolutely and that's a big thing too for me is we're all learning we all have our own different areas of what we're good at what we're not good at and so I'm not one of those people where if I'm not great at something I'll just tell you right off the bat that's not my specialty uh you know, people might call me, I have activity in my house, I'll be the first to say, call the EVP medium, because that's <laughs> not what I do. Well, we appreciate any referrals, um, <laughs> that's for sure. And, you know, everybody has their own feeling about mediums and, and what to expect when they get a reading, and that's what makes us all unique. Mm-hmm. Uh, I see your your references all the time, people are always making comments about how comfortable and how approachable you are. And that means a lot when people are wanting to sit down one on one, and especially when it's something personal, they want to feel that that contact. They want to feel that they're not being judged, right. and that you're genuine, and that you feel good about what you're doing. And that makes a big difference. And you know, we see that in in your your references. We also see that in the shop that you work through. If if you have a great connection with the surroundings, it's only going to portray that to your clients. And, and I think that really means a lot. We tell Sue and Nancy that all the time, that they can mm-hmm. never, ever move that shop. <laughs> right. We don't care how big right. you get. You're going to stay in that little shop because there is a connection and that people feel comfortable and, and feel at home when they walk through the front door. You know, I'm there so much that it really is. <laughs> I think I probably spend as much time it's there as home. I do. Oh, yeah, it is. It really is my second home. And not only just geographically being on the lake but like you said sue and nancy over i mean i've known them for many many years but just the past seven years of working together they're my family Mm -hmm. and when you have that sort of rapport uh people sense that Mm -hmm. even if they're just walking in to look at product there's there's that family connection to where i know if i had something go wrong at four in the morning i could pick up the phone and call sue and nancy and they'd be there and Mm -hmm. i think that emulates into everything the services the classes things of that nature it's genuine yeah yeah and that's you know how they got their name it's your journey yes it is life is a journey folks and uh it's it's too bad that many of us don't discover that until late in our lives and um you know no matter what your age uh you know having travis on the show tonight uh, to talk about the fringe, and what I would have believed was the fringe at some point. There is something much greater than all of us, something greater than our nine to five job and our bills and our stress. There is guidance out there uh, to help you um, in your life's journey. And we're really honored, uh, Travis, that you were able to join us today and be on the show. It was exciting. It was a great, great interview. It flew by really fast, and uh, I think that happens when you have fun. I've really enjoyed myself, so thank you. It was awesome. Thank you, and we'll definitely have to have you back on. For sure. And uh, we definitely want to have you come on and talk about your new book when when it's out. I would love to. After this uh, interview with Travis, I just wanted to kind of put it out there that Mediumship plays a big, important role in our personal lives, but it also has a lot to do with paranormal research and with our team that we're involved in, our our paranormal team, which is EVP Mediums. That's what my role is. I go in, kind of connect with spirits if they want to connect with me, also pick up on what's going on with the team. And it's also cool. I, I think it always, well, it never ceases to amaze me how... Uh, Randy will get an impression of the property 
before we even get there. And uh, his description of that property uh, usually is spot on. It's quite amazing. Uh, and I'll be honest, in the beginning, I just thought it was uh, Randy's imagination. You know, I thought, okay, well, that that's, uh, you know, he's not doing it intentionally, but he's coming up with this stuff, and it's by chance. But over and over and over again, um, uh, the whole team, we stopped questioning him, him uh, because um, it always turns out to be, you're right, Randy. It's the old shit <laughs> of course moment. I am, David. I'm always right. <laughs> but, you know, we, do, we want people to follow up. If, if you have an interest in mediumship, Travis is a great resource, you know, with his books and what he does in the shop with his classes. So follow up on that. If you have an interest in the paranormal, you can follow up with us on evpmediums.com. Yeah, and we also check out our uh, YouTube channel, uh, EVP Mediums. And uh, if you like what you see, please subscribe uh, to the channel, and you'll be alerted every time we post new investigation. Actually, we have a new investigation coming up uh, this week, so um, and we have one that is ready to be posted. So we actually have a, a few investigations that are out there that will be coming up soon uh, as we document our findings and communicate with uh, spirit. And it's also uh, to back up on Travis. Um, Randy went through a period when he was trying to understand his gifts. Uh, he had no clue how to handle them. And uh, Travis, uh, his book, I Am Psychic, uh, So Are You, is a good way for you to identify if you have these abilities and, and how to handle them. Um, so don't feel discouraged and don't feel like you're going crazy. You know, um, These gifts, uh, people do have them. And uh, I've seen it and I now believe in it. So if you like what you hear, follow us again on Facebook. We have the Paranormal Road page. We also have EVP Mediums. And follow us on YouTube with our videos. And also on Podbean, you can listen to all of our episodes. Yes, please. Uh, give us a like on Podbeans. And if you are um, on Apple, have Apple products and are on iTunes, it's really helps us out if you would give us a five-star rating or a high rating and a review. Writing a review helps us in the search engine so more people can find us. So this uh, pretty much wraps up this episode. We're excited about next week. If you're into the cryptids, you're going to want to tune in uh, to next week's show. And uh, everyone, please have a wonderful and fantastic week. <laughs>